Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Growth House Podcast. It's your host, Jesse Ray. Today, I'm here with my man, Mike. Mike, how you doing? You know, just another beautiful day to take over the world with you, Jesse. So excited to be on and, uh, you know, help your investors and the listeners to help them take over the world. I love it, man. Yes. Yeah, so our investors are basically those people that are in corporate America, high income and looking to achieve financial freedom and then, you know, start their own business, expand their portfolio with real estate. So with that being said, what I want to do, Mike, is let's start with where you're at currently. Currently, what are you up to? What projects are you working on? And then we'll take a step back. How would you get started in entrepreneurship? Absolutely. So we're the so we primarily we're based in Nashville, Tennessee. We focus specifically on multifamily. We are a general partner on 670 units, which I always say I always like to poke fun at syndicators because I am one. That that doesn't mean we own all of them. We own a small piece of all of them, uh, and our mission is to help you know make our investors wealthier. Uh, and then recently, in the last six months, uh, we started an asset management consulting firm because we've seen we talked offline, but. There's been so much fraud uh, within partnerships, within property managers, and anywhere in between. And our our mission is we're operators who can raise money. We're not ra people who can raise money and then have to operate. So uh, we have a full team. We have a analyst internally for asset management. We have a financial manager to help with our asset management. Um, and then we have an acquisitions person and a marketing person. So we handle all things asset management. If we have to get our hands dirty, we'll do some parts of the property management. Um, and we have clients all across the country. And then our, we're closing on two deals in Denver in the next 30 days. And we are just looking to continue to expand in Denver, where we have, we're partnered with Quantum Capital. Uh, and then we're just, you know, we submitted on a couple LOIs. We didn't win, but we made good runs in uh, Tennessee. So we're just, Really looking to continue to our own our operations and, like I said, take over the world one unit, apartment, community at a time. <laughs> it sounds like you're doing a great job of doing that, man. Well, we're trying, you know, right? Blackstone's, <laughs> Blackstone has a little caveat and a couple other bigger owners, but, you know, we're figured let's, let's own it before they do. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, Mike, because uh, as a syndicator and people that, you know, care about unit count, how many, how many doors do you put on your Instagram bio? Oh, shh. Well, first off, it's all about the AUM because that's what we manage. But uh, I always do them. And I always tell every podcast the story is like my first deal was 143 units uh, and I owned 0.53% of the deal. Now, so it's like anyone who flexes units in AUM, like AUM is, I think, a real because like as an operator, I pride myself in managing it and making sure it's ha we have the right system and the right team. And so that's why we spun off and did some consulting work to help just build more infrastructure and to really test the system. Uh, but I think overall, you know, the units don't, units don't matter at the end of the day, investors want to get paid. And we've just seen from operators floating rate debt, there's been so much shenanigans and a 13 year bull run uh, that we're going, you know, people come to me and are like, can you believe that rents are only going up 3%? I go, historically, that's all it's been. 7% interest rates, historical average. So we're not surprised by it, but um, I will say it was frustrating losing to deals who operators who bought with floating rate debt, and then they flash sold it to the price that we would have paid for it, you know, two years ago. So, um, you know, we're just very transparent. We're radically honest. Um, and we just want to make sure investors know what they're getting into. And that's why I pride myself in just any investor who calls me within 24 hours. I'm, if I don't pick up, give me 24 hours and we'll talk and we'll keep it real from when I got robbed from 153 grand from my 36 unit to a chief marketing officer lying to me. There's so much shenanigans that happened that, um, you know, we just wanted to make sure that it doesn't happen to anyone else. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of floating rate debt, do you want to explain what that is to the audience? Yeah. So floating rate debt is a essentially think of your house mortgage is generally 30 years fixed. The interest rate stays the same. Well, what the problem in multifamily is when you got these loans, there's a large prepayment penalty. And uh, essentially, because these instruments get traded on Wall Street, 
you have to, if you sell the mortgage early, you have to pay a prepayment penalty. Well, as rents went up, values went up, a lot of these groups were like, man, I don't, I'm losing so millions of dollars on this prepayment. So we're going to take on more risk by having floating rate debt. And so rates were two, three years ago, one to 2%. And they're like, you know, they're going to stay low for a longer period of time. And there's lesser prepayment penalties. And so every month or quarter, I forget, it depends on which one, but your floating rate rises up with the 10 year treasury or um, depending on the loan. But interest rates have gone up 800% and they haven't gone up this fast since the 80s. And so everyone is paying, I shouldn't say everyone, but many groups are paying their reserve, paying reserves just to pay interest payments, uh, doing capital calls and renegotiating debt. So it's really good when the tides go up, it can be incredibly problematic when it goes down. So any investors is just making sure that they know floating rate debt and the larger groups there, they can give the keys back and there's less ramifications, but like for syndicators, it could just be a terrible, um, you know, strategy if you're not prepared or bolstered with enough reserves to handle those tough times. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my audience wants to know, especially the guests that we have on the show, whether or not you guys are focused now after kind of reaching financial freedom, leaving the corporate job, are you focused more on passive or active income? And then do you have, you know, a portfolio of homes or rentals outside of what you are doing with the syndication or the multifamily? Yeah. So I've invested in my buddy Dylan Marma's um, mobile home park communities as uh, through my self-directed retirement account. Uh, Dylan Marma, I'm happy to give an intro. Uh, he's the one who got me into starting in multifamily. Uh, he's up to 2,500 units uh, in mobile homes and just a, a phenomenal operator. Uh, but I look at how I look at it is Mike Ayala. I heard him on a podcast say, I want to have as much active income and passive income. And I think a lot of people um, on podcasts are like, I don't work. I don't do this. I think it's important like to have your basic needs met. But at the end of the day, like working with Dan Gilbert and Quicken Loans, it's like he he could have done nothing once he owned the Cavs or Quicken Loans and for the rest of his life. But he still wanted to make an impact by investing in esports orgs and media production companies. And so I think you know, whatever your mission is, like having your human basic needs met and that can vary right like if you're baller shot caller and you need 20k a month if you need 5k a month whatever that number is for you great and then from there it's just continuing to build and have fun and make it that impact so even when you leave your job uh, as someone who hated 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 being an accountant auditor it was the worst I just, it gave me the freedom to do business and to do deals with people I know and I like and I want to do business with. And uh, you have that flexibility and mobility financially to do it. Now, and even if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, I like my job, am I crazy? No, it's okay. And just, it allows you to invest into other things and cool things and have that flexibility. So don't don't feel like you have to leave your job just, <laughs> just to say you did. <laughs> I love that explanation. That's something that I did as well. Like I didn't hate my job. It wasn't too hard. I was in sales. And then once I hit hundred K more or less, you know, semi passive through my rentals with co-living, then I was like, okay, now I can buy back, you know, 40 hours of my time. I actually can work with people I enjoy and I can do stuff I'm more passionate about. And that's when I started growth house, the community, et cetera. So I totally love that example. So Mike, let's take a step back, man. I mean, you work with Dan Gilbert owner of you know the calves like how did all this start you were a cpa like walk me through that journey to then starting and getting into real estate yeah so i think two major points in like college which i know people like dog on college now but college served me because i was getting an accounting and cpa to, uh, license and i in college i started a screen printing company with my roommates and we did 20 grand in sales in nine months so we're doing 900 dollars craigslist deals to get a press to then buy shirts, to make for tailgates. Um, and we did 20K in sales in nine months. I'm like, wow, we went from like a Craigslist deal to being like the top shirt maker. Like we did 500 shirts for Central Michigan's Greek Week. And that was like, 
mind blown of like, oh, I thought I'd have to work. Like, by no means did we like make it a ton of money, but like we, it created the opportunity of entrepreneurship. And my professor, Isabel Wang, who I love, uh, I just spoke to Michigan State, was like, I asked her one day and I'm like, am I going to like accounting? And she laughed in my face. And I was like, that's kind of weird. And I'm like, and I have a good rapport with her then, but I like, I was just too young to know. And so five years, I was like, I, I loved audit with the big four because I got to see the risks that people don't talk about when it comes to financials and what could go wrongs. Uh, and then I got pretty much because I just always led with value with people, even my branding value add Mike, I just want to help people. So I literally made a horizontal move to work for, work for Dan Gilbert. And even when they hired me, they're like, we don't know how much Dan's going to invest. And I'm like, in startups. And I was like, you know, well, when he does, I'll be there. And then we worked on 12 to 14 startups and I helped launch two. Uh, Woodward Original, a media production company. And then I was in the early content of 100 Thieves, an esports organization. So nothing like modeling, professional video gamers, setting up payroll companies, doing all these things. And it just, you got, seeing those intricacies was like, oh, I believe in my, I can, if these people can run a business, I can do it too. And so I did two single family houses. I was a terrible landlord and also really good at getting yelled at by my dad on how not to fix stuff. And that's why I realized single, like being the landlord was not my thing. Being in front of a spreadsheet was. And so for six months to a year, I literally 10 PM to 2 AM underwriting a deal for other groups, volunteering, um, connecting people, doing a blog for, for a group, doing podcasts just to get my name out there. I got to work for a family office in Knoxville, Tennessee, where we did 400 units uh, and then recently spun off in the last two years to just kind of work for my own branding. So I always lead with value because I want the experience because I just wanted to see and do cool things knowing that one day it'll pay off. And even then it's like, I'm still, you know, I'm five years full time, literally last Friday in commercial real estate. And now I'm partnering with like Mark Henteman and Quantum Capital, who's the writer of Family Guy and has been doing this since the 90s. Um, and so if you lead with value, the rest will fall into place and opportunities that you can imagine. And I hate being this like super cliche, but the more you add value, the more opportunities come. Whether it's I love that. And, not. and for context, Mike, you're like, what, 32, 33? 32. Yep. 32 years old. So you've done a lot in the last few years. And I think also, in addition to, you know, providing value, you were intentional. You worked with a family office that was investing in multifamily, which sounds like that was your goal to get into there. But I want to take a step back just a little bit because I heard you on a couple of podcasts. And I'm sorry. you have this... <laughs> <laughs> you, you have this grind that you did and i don't know how long maybe you can tell me but you were literally working working 10 p.m to 2 a.m you would pass out because you were focused on underwriting deals figuring out this whole multifamily game how long did you do that grind for yeah i did it for six months and i did the best ever conference in 2019 i stayed up till 2 a.m meeting everyone even my friend who was there was like i need to meet this like uh, an insurance broker. I'm like, oh, this person. I met every single person, I think, and could tell you their story. But that's, and literally, I slept 42 hours in three days, like two or three days. And I thought I was dying. And my girlfriend was laughing at me, going, no, you idiot. You hit exhaustion. I'm like, what's that? And I, because I was just so passionate to get out of accounting, I wouldn't wish that upon my enemy looking back. And, um, even now being 32, looking back, if I made five calls a day to investors who are in multifamily, that's 2,500 calls a year. If you did two weeks off, I would have gotten just as far then doing that instead of just trying to kill myself after work, even to the point where I was like going to get fired from my job. <laughs> so you don't have like, we're in a rush on what we can do in a year. But like, if you gave yourself, if you told any startup, you'd be like, it takes 10 years to make money. I'm on year five. And it's by no means, it's like, we're making impact, 
But at the end of the day, I'm still working for my investors because that's my fiduciary responsibilities to help them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I had that similar, you know, time frame where I was working and then after work, I was, you know, studying real estate, figuring stuff out. My problem was I wasn't taking action. I was just in analysis paralysis. Uh. <laughs> so that was my, so that's what they all to tell the audience, like actually go out there and do it. Your first deal is not going to be a home run. Like just get started, but also have a mentor because it's either mentor or mistakes. So find someone who has fruit in the tree, who knows what they're doing, tie yourself to them. And I think if I remember correctly, you worked for free for a while. Yeah. I worked for th three to four months working for a group out of Atlanta underwriting. And so, and that happened from the best ever conference. They posted, we're looking to hire an analyst, 300 people applied. I was the first call because I wrote in the ad, I'll do it for free. And they're like, we know we'll pay you. And I go, I, I know, but there's a reason you called me. <laughs> and so because of that, that got me the next job. And it just, you know, because I had an accounting background, they're like, oh, this person could do our accounting worst case. And it's just like getting into the room. And now if you're working a W2 job and you're like, I had, you know, I don't want to work 10 to two, it's like become an LP and even, you know, a passive investor because then you're in the game of multifamily and then you can read the updates and ask questions. And as long as you're forefront of like, I want to learn more, there are operators and syndicators that will allow you to ask questions. Um, so I think that there's, it, you just have to partner with the right people. And I think, I hate the cliche, no like and trust, but like have them share the horror stories of like the, the bad stuff that happened because if they haven't had anything bad happen to them, they haven't had enough experience yet. <laughs> Cause I mean, even, yeah, I, I literally start most of my investor calls. Like how did I, I lost 153 grand in three months from a property manager stealing from us. But flip side, I took over operations and we turned it around in three months, right? Hey, we were 70% occupied for a month in Denver. We got a chief marketing, chief marketing officer fired and a leasing manager. I flew into Denver and we had a three hour conversation with uh, the whole team because the systems were broken and I identified three. So if there, if people aren't willing to fly out to fix their mistake, like owning in your backyard is important, can be important, but you just have to have access to it and make sure that it's going well. And like for even for LPs, you can use Uber Eats to check on the property. You can use, you know. Okay, hold on. How, how would how would you do that? I've heard uh, you see where used to check out a property. Um, so um, this land flipper in GoBundance, uh, the tax deed guy, I forget his name, but literally, um, you order Uber Eats to the property, and as soon as they gets the order, you just call the person you're like, "Hey, keep the food. I'll tip you well. Drive around and take pictures of the property." I almost did this with my manager because he kept lying for a month and saying this gutter was fixed and it wasn't. And I was like, if I, it was the wrong day. Cause if I found out it wasn't fixed, I was going to like lose my mind. Um, but you can check on the property and now you have boots on the ground who can tell you like, is this a good area? So the, the term that I like to use is like leverage. LPs are leveraging the operator's experience and know-how to get a return. You know, we use leverage for virtual assistants. We use leverage in everyday life, right? You're leveraging the bank to buy your house. And so the more leverage you have, as long as you're not over levered, but like if you have the right le amount of leverage in all aspects of your life, you can live a very fulfilling life and you don't, and life doesn't have to be hard and you don't have to do all the work and no one is saying you have to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Walk me through what do you think is the best first like point of leverage that most people should be using and probably not using? Um, so this saved my relationship. It's a beautiful app called Instacart because I was living in Chicago and my girlfriend had something going on. Uh, and I go up to Kroger with her basket and all of the people we've I've seen them a bunch. They know me. And they still like, oh, where's your girlfriend? And I go, oh, she couldn't make it. And they start laughing. And it's because it's the dead of winter. And I, I swear she ordered nine pounds of just soups, uh, 10 pounds of vegetables, a watermelon. And I'm like, what is going on? And I just come back dripping sweat. And I'm like, we're never ordering. I'm never 
going to the grocery store ever again. It gives me anxiety. I hate it. I feel like everyone's trying to steal my stuff. And for a, it's a little bit more, but literally the next week we ordered it in Chicago and it's pouring rain as someone's bringing us toilet paper. And I'm like, yes. Um, so like that, uh, we just got to, so that's like the first thing. Is it a little bit more expensive? Yes. Um, but I think that's like a little bit of leverage. Then you got from like cleaning your house, doing laundry. Um, those are the things that like are little. And as long as you make, I will caveat, you have to be intentional with the time you're saving. Because even as my role as a leader, we're hiring, we hired a financial manager to do asset management. And it's very easy to do nothing. <laughs> but you, you know, if you go on to spend time with your significant other, or you read a book that you're intentional or you're writing or creating, that's where you have to spend your time. And even like now in that initial leverage, I'm now working out more. I'm writing stand up. I'm performing more open mics. So like it allows you to be the, a truer version of yourself. And if you need to take a nap in the middle of the day, then do that too. But just make sure you set an intention of like this hour a week that I save, make it worthwhile. Because the last thing you want to do is just kick back and do nothing. And now you're kind of back into that circular reference of, you know, of not adding value into your life. So, you know, I got to pivot real quick. We'll come back to multifamily. You <laughs> mentioned something that I just got to ask you to talk yeah. about. Because a lot of us as entrepreneurs, people who are, you know, in the grind, looking to achieve financial freedom, become a millionaire, whatever the goal is, we basically look at, Everything in our life, we say, none of this, we're just focused on one thing, right? Mm -hmm. We forget about relationships, we forget about hobbies, we forget about a lot of stuff. You mentioned oh, yeah. something that sounds like it's a hobby for you, which is stand-up. Talk to me about that. When did you get into it? And then has that been like an outlet for creativity while you're also working? Like, talk, talk more about that because I think it's very it's interesting and also I think people need to <laughs> hear this. Yeah, so... I hated audit so much in accounting that I would listen to Pandora stand up every single day. Uh, I did an open mic in 2021, 22. And it, I got more than one laugh and I'm like, awesome. So I've always aspired and like, listen to, I could tell you, I listen to stand up every day. I've been to more stand up shows than concerts by a landslide. Um, but I just wanted, like, I, I've always, loved comedy because it helps like deflect but also it's just like making people laugh is just such a rush uh it is the coolest thing in the world to make a room of ne like there's funny when you banter with the boys or your friends but nothing like getting a room to laugh over like a crazy thing you said now i you know i'd say clean er than most like someone that came up to me was like are you like a bob sag and i'm like whoa no that's so far but like, I like to say the dark thing because it's like unexpected and then the, the twist and it's so much fun. Um, but it's just like an outlet. Like I'm literally my whole last, you know, what, 10 years I've been doing spreadsheets, analyzing deals. Uh, but even now at 32, two years into my own venture, I've created an like leverage and, and work is different, right? So if you're starting off, you have to have the know-how to make sure it gets done. Once you start getting team members, your job is to hold the vision. Um, and I know like Brian Lubin has been on, I think on this pod and uh, friends with him, but seeing his vision and holding it is a lot of work. I used to be very, I don't want to say envious, but I used to kind of look down at the people who are like, I have this vision, I'm going to manifest and buy crystals and tell myself it's going to happen. But I realized it, because that was, I was that grinder mode and I hate, like, it's just like, I have to make this many calls and do this many things and check. And it's like, it doesn't have to be hard. <laughs> so holding that vision is different work, but it's just like making people like I did comedy because like, I want to make people laugh. I want to help investors. I want to help people. And so it's like a different form of value add, but it just is a different outlet. And it's just helped me meet new cool people that I would have never met elsewhere. That's awesome, man. How's it been? Like how many shows have you done now? I've done, I did one house show about like 50 people. 
Uh, I've done about 20 open mics, uh, applying for more showcases. Uh, I'm like 0 for 6, but still applying. But that's kind of the beauty of it. It's like I'm year one, but half of that year was like not as committed to it because it's just like grind mode. But it's just like, you know, year one, you suck at everything. Like if you looked at your first underwriting on a deal versus like your last one, you're like, I didn't even know. Like when you bought your first house, you're like, I can make how much? And it's like, oh, you don't even like flood zones and FEMA flood maps and all this stuff. So it's just like, um, you know, I went from getting laughed at, which is a mind fuck on stage, to like getting laughs. And it's just like a cool, you know, you're just expressing yourself and having no expectations and just seeing what works. <laughs> That's so cool because I can relate. Uh, in college, right after actually it was during college, I was a ghostwriter, so I wrote for local oh. artists. And uh, one of our artists got signed by Akon, went on tour with some you know big name uh, rappers, and then I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do my own solo show, <laughs> bro. The first solo show I did, I forgot all my lyrics. It was oh so yeah, bad. so bad. I was I under mean, 21. This... I had the X on my head. I was, oh, it, my was, it was yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's Never been a set that. where I literally did two minutes because I forgot my whole middle after I didn't get a laugh. And you're just like, well, we'll put that in the bad pile and keep keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And also on my bucket list is to do a stand up like, you know, open mic. How long are those typically? Like how many minutes? Four minutes. Four minutes? Four minutes. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to run my set by you first so you can give me some critique. Deal. <laughs> Perfect. I'll, I'll go straight for you. I, I'm better at punching <laughs> up. Go. My girlfriend's better at storytelling. I'm set punch. So, but like, have like the whole reason we're doing all of this is fun, right? Like multifamily, like I wasn't going, I'm my whole twenties was like, get the experience to become financially free and even like the net worth. So I'm in GoBundance. And once I got qualified for GoBundance, the streamers and confetti and the paparazzi and the merit, like the band didn't come through. It was just me sitting at an Excel going, Oh, I'm, I hit this net worth goal. And I'm like, I'm working a job I don't like. Uh, I'm just grinding my face off. I'm ignoring my girlfriend. I'm ignoring my health. And so it's just like, there's more to life than work. If you like what you do, then like, that's fine. But like, do the thing that scares you. Like saying a joke at an open mic. I'm going to hold you to it. You're going to do it by the end of this year, the latest. But no, like you live once. No one cares because they're all insecure about what they're worried about or their status and ego. And but like, have fun. Mm -hmm. It's a good time. <laughs> I'm excited for it. He just put a deadline, so by the end of the year, so I got uh, about six months. So there you go. Maybe I'll do it when I'm on a uh, when I'm in Europe. I got a I got a little Europe tour. I'll do it with Brian. Brian Lewis, all right. So. <laughs> I don't know the European good. styles, but like, hey, <laughs> when in Rome. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, I want to take a step back. So yeah. some people in our community, they're like, we want to get to multifamily. I'm not a multifamily expert, never even invested in multifamily. So you already gave us kind of step one. You said, if you're a high income earner, don't quit that job right away. It's not, you know, all that it seems unless you hate it. So do this in the right way. And from my understanding, what you said is go be an LP in a deal. Learn from that syndicator, learn from the GPs, ask some questions that they allow you. And then also ask them the horror stories. But after that, what's that next step if they want to go and invest and potentially raise capital and do their own deals? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, I would say, have it. I think the big who, not how, and I think it's always funny the visionary versus integrator discussion that everyone has. But I think at the end of the day, is like you need to have enough who's in your corner to do a deal. Right. I can, my, I did a 36 unit. I had, I put all of the due diligence money in and I was like, I, we better close because I have $300 left into my name and it's got to close. Now I wouldn't advise that to anyone, but I believed in the deal that much or I felt confident in doing it and closing it. Um, but just making sure you have a key principle. I see a lot of newer investors who a key principle is someone who has the net worth of the loan amount. And they call it the post-close liquidity, which is 20% of the loan and just cash, uh, stocks, easy to access. Uh, because the last thing I want any of your listeners to do is go, I'm going to go call a 100-unit apartment complex tomorrow because it has the scale and all this. 
you know, every insert, every podcast ever about multifamily. And then you get the deal and then you don't have the money. You don't have the loan requirements, right? You don't have the property manager, the lawyers. It takes a whole team. And that's why I love multifamily. It is a team sport. Jesse, you could buy a house tomorrow and I have full confidence in you that it will do great. Multifamily is a very, it's their syndication attorneys. There's, there's just so many people on a team. And so I challenge all of your listeners, call five people who are interested. And I, and I love when people go, I don't have a CRM or I don't have a website. You have a contact list on your phone of hundreds of people, unless you don't have friends. And that's a different discussion. But you have hundreds of people in your phone that know someone who's probably in real estate. And so just go, hey, I'm looking to do this, buy apartments. Do you know anyone who's in it? And they may, they may not, but you're in the game by just looking for the who's. Um, and then there's different areas, buying, finding the deal or funding the deal. And so I think it's important you understand how to underwrite, but talk to people who underwrite deals and add volunteer to work for them for free. Or just say, hey, I found this deal. Can we compare numbers? I want to help add, like adding value to an existing group will, is the shortest way to get into a deal. And like you said at the beginning, you're not going to get rich off it, but you're in the game. And once you're in the game, the game gets much easier because my first week in multifamily, I learned more than any podcast I ever listened to because literally every podcast like five years ago was like, have you heard of implementing rubs? And I'm like, we got 10 other things going on besides rubs that we got to solve for. Like there's people stealing from us. The old man, we might get sued for not closing a day early. Like there's just like so much stuff that happens. Um, but like, it's okay to be an LP, but if you want to do deals, just I challenge your listeners to make five calls looking for people who are in the game and just figure out like the thing you're good at. If you're good at marketing, most syndicators suck at marketing. Ghostwriting, all these things are super important that you can add your own twist to and add value to them. I love that. If you had to start over and you needed to make 10K a month, how would you make 10K a month? I would be a broker in multifamily. Or, well, 10K a month. I'd probably be a broker in some sort of real estate because that could be wholesaling, that could be flipping. At the end of the day, like sales, and that's why when we were talking before is like being in sales, I, I could tell you every reason why not to buy a deal. Every single family house I looked at in 2016, 17, I should have bought every single one of those. <laughs> I told my broker who's now an LP and I'm like, Hey man, I'm sorry. I put you through hell, but it was my first deal and I was super nervous. Um, but I'd be a, a broker to make a lot of money because it's transactions and it's dialing. And guess what? Those five people that I'm challenging your invest listeners to, you're doing a hundred a day. <laughs> so you're knowing the owners, the lawyers, everyone involved as fast as possible. And then from there you can go, do I want to continue to broker or do the buying side? Um, I think there's just a lot of resentment towards sales. Some people have, um, especially with there's like the influencers who like, Andy Elliott taking his shirt off and it's like, you gotta have abs, but it gives you all the who's you need to successfully do deals. So I would, I would say become a broker to meet the people who I'd want to work with or just be a broker. It's hard, but so is any other, comp any new thing is hard and that's okay, but just keep going and success will come as long as you don't quit. Now, what's that like quote you always see, like choose your hard, like either yeah. work a job that you hate for the rest of your life. That's hard. Or go do something new that scares the shit out of you, but get over that fear. That's going to be hard too, but it's going to be a lot, a lot more less painful because it's not going to be as long. So, yeah. so true there. Yeah, and if Mike, you, like I said, even too, like if you had your job, making good money and having health insurance is also pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, health insurance is a lot cheaper than I thought. Because once I left my job, like, dude, everyone's scared of health insurance. Like, a hundred dollars, one hundred fifty bucks more a month. Like, I think people have these misconceptions of like how. I think the cost savings thing gets. I've I've had some 
questionable quote insurance that's like yeah you got to do some <laughs> some prayer like even yesterday it was like what's this insurance but it's like religious based it's so convoluted and i agree it's it, it's not the be all end all but like pick your heart it doesn't and it's not i promise you it's not as hard as you think and that's why i challenge people to call everyone that wants to do the thing they want to do because it's much easier and in the circles you're in, it just, it gets much easier. Mm. And let's actually talk about the circles because for me, a huge reason that I was able to, you know, grow and get around, you know, like-minded people helped me achieve financial freedom at a very young age. And that was my circles, my mentors, my coaches, and the communities I was around. You're part of GoBundance, which is an amazing community. Was there other communities or mentors or coaches that really helped you kind of expedite your growth? Yeah, I've had three coaches uh, at all different aspects. So my first coach uh, helped me. He literally is the only, he I would say only, but he connected me to the family office in Knoxville to get into multifamily. My second coach was the coach to help me think big enough to leave my job. And I'll never forget the day he goes, what day are you leaving your job? And I picked that day and I stuck to it and it still chills down my spine. My third coach, I think uh, I call it the dude bro culture of like, do more, grind your face off, rah. And it's like, well, let's, you know, there's some tra trauma. Everyone has it. Everyone has their problems. And it's like you, it's fearless coaching. Um, and in three weeks, I've like overhauled how I talk to myself internally, how I like, I would get so like, um, paralyzed by just like, am I doing any the right things? Cause it's just like, there's so much going on in entrepreneurship. And so all of those, I would not be where I am talking to you if it weren't for those three coaches. I wouldn't be here if my professor laughed at me saying I'd suck at accounting. So like mentorship can be different. Now it doesn't mean you have to pay like a guru or anything, but like just add value to good people and the world will, the karma, universe, God, whatever you believe in will pay you back 10x, 100x, 1000x. It just takes time and don't rush it and don't compare to others and life will be good. <laughs> you know, I got to ask you about the day you quit your job now. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> walk, walk, walk me through that story because you just said it almost got you emotional. Uh, I think the biggest thing was um, making the decision was hard. But I think going out on my own was because I was very transparent of like, I was always aspiring to get equity in deals. And I realized I was never going to be the principal of the firm. And, I, and when I say principal, that doesn't mean like the person, the face, right? I'm okay being a team player and all of this because I wouldn't be here with my partners, my team, my investors, everyone. I have, I'm just a very selfless person, but when I tell you is the scariest thing I've ever done, I barely said the words out of it. And like, I didn't tell anyone except like my girlfriend. And I, and I intentionally gave a, a two month notice. I stayed an extra month. Um, and it was just very emotional because it was like, these were partners on my deals that I'm still partners with. But the role wasn't, I, I had a bigger calling in terms of operations. I wanted to help more people. And, that, and leading with that value, it just awoken me to realize the impact and the systems I can bring. Whether it's a 10 unit in Spokane, in Arkansas, Louisiana, wherever it is, I just had a bigger calling to help more investors. And especially during this time, like even now, where rents aren't going up 20%. Frauds on, fraudulent stories are happening all the time. And so it just makes me emotional to just, um, thinking of that impact I have to my investors, my community, even my mom is like, Hey, do you know real estate is risky? And it's like, it's not as risky, mom. Don't let, but it's just, people come to me and, um, want to learn more. And I, and I just am very honest and I want to help everyone be better investors, people, operators, whatever your mission is. I just want to help connect with people and, uh, leaving that job helped me realize it. And uh, I'm still figuring it out, but it's cool to just help and meet people like you and then help people take over the world in whatever aspect they have and want to. 
I love that. As we wrap up, Mike, in three to five years, what do you want that life to look like for you? So I just did my first ever vivid vision. Let's uh, go. So I always thought it was BS. And it's not. <laughs> did I promise. Did Brian put you onto that? A uh, little bit, but more of just like you hear enough people say it and you eye roll it as a systems, logical, rational, like as a person. But I think a lot of people don't know what they want in life. And I didn't either. Um, so my three year vision is to have, or five year, I think it's five year vision, 2 billion assets under management, one that we own, one that we, 1 billion that we consult on, uh, family with two kids, uh, dream house in Nashville. And then we just get under contract on our second house on the lake. Um, I, and we, start a vertically integrated property management company to help the execution and to help investors have that value add strategy in house. So then they never have to hear about a third party property manager ever again. Um, and just help as many people, um, just help investors onboard a family office, uh, and then just have a, a kick ass team to just take over the world with and, Go from there. How'd you feel after you finished? Were you like, I'm glad I did this. I feel more clear. Yes. Or were you like, this is BS. It, okay. I will say as any, like I, even saying it, it feels like I get nervous saying it. Cause it's like, it's big. Um, but I, it's, it's clear in what I want because it's, I can help scale my internal team that I currently have. I can hire better people. Um, I can help more people. And it's always it's always leading with value because I've never been like, I want to be worth X dollars. It's like, I just want to help as many residents. That's like even another thing too, is we don't call them tenants, it's residents because these are people's homes. So it's just like, if I own a, you know, a billion under management and two billion or a, and help another billion in assets under management, Think of how many families I can help. Think of like their homes. Like our core value is like to re uh, revitalize communities. So it always starts with communities and that starts with a unit and a move in and a move out. And like, if so, if we can help those people in their homes, how else can we, you know, their jobs, their impact, that community that's just like not is struggling, how can we help it? And like even my 36 unit, I had 21 of the 36 residents in a month call me crying saying we haven't had anyone answer uh, our calls or emails or texts. Uh, and that got me so fired up that I told them like, I, I introduced myself as the owner is that bad. And I told them, I'm sorry, I failed you as an owner. This will be fixed immediately. And I worked tirelessly to get it fixed and make sure that bad people weren't in their homes and that they felt comfortable in their homes and we got it fixed in three months. And that's my commitment to my residents. That's my commitment to my investors, our team and everyone in between. Gosh, this is a good story. And I think that's anyone listening. Like if you're in real estate, you are also have an impact on people's lives. So it could be good or it could be bad. And so for you, this knowing that and also realizing like you actually want to serve and add value to those people. Like, I think we all think of like the unit count, but we forget there's people, people's lives that we're helping who live in the houses that we have. And so that's our big thing too, just with our community, even though it's more niched down to like entrepreneurs and business professionals, but it's like, how can I give you the best experience possible? How can we, you know, have someone in the house if you don't have a job, how do we find you a job ASAP? Like we are able to change people's lives. So I'm so glad you shared that story. Well, even, even when you said it, you're like, I just, it's, it's just niche down in the language we use every day. It's like, you're fulfilling a need that people didn't even know was a thing. So it's, you know, just be careful with the language you use of just, or I only have this, um, you're learning, growing and expanding and you never knew what's possible. And that's why you're listening to this podcast. You're listening to Jesse and the great guests he has. Um, and so that's why it's just like meet as many people and reach out to them. I'm very available. Uh, Jesse is too, cause they know he cares about his listeners and whatever we can do to help serve. That's all that matters. 
and we're here for you. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I appreciate you reminding me of that because it's so true. Before I have people know how to find you, just like you said, we want to provide value to our guests, people that provide value to us. We are a go giving community. We will have no one reach out to you that says, "Hey, can I pick your brain, Mike?" If they do, <laughs> send it to me, and I'm going to block them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when people reach out to you, Mike, they're going to add some kind of value, whether it's something small or some resource or a who that you're looking for. How can someone add value to you before they ask you a question? I think the biggest thing is we're looking for LPs who, who want to be in part of deals. Um, active, passive, first deal, 10th deal. We just want to connect with LPs. Our bigger kind of rock that we're working on and rock is a quarterly goal is working with family offices that want to invest. Um, we love the retail investors. They do great, but to make as big of an impact, we need, we just need larger check writers and so that we can do bigger deals and make more of an impact. And because I pride myself in being a good operator, uh, the investor relations sides, I could be, I could improve on and improving on and building that system. Um, so anyone who wants to invest or learn more on investing, uh, would love to schedule a 15 minute call, um, to pick, you know, I say pick their brain, but just to get in the game. If I could be your first investor relations call, I would love to have that opportunity with your listeners. And, um, I'll give my email, my handles, whatever it is. Uh, I just want to help serve them and just meet more investors that want to be passive. What's, what's typically the check minimum? Uh, the minimum's 50K on, uh, I'd say 50 to 75 is usually the minimum. Uh, I will tell people, don't ask. I will give this tidbit. Don't ask on the first call what's the lowest amount. Continue to build rapport because there's the marketed price and then there's the friends and family. So if you're in a liquidity crunch or stuff happens, but I've talked to you for three years about this opportunity, and I know how important it is, there's exceptions. But I've seen a lot of investors on that first call ask 47 questions, and then the last one's how much, how little money can I give you? <laughs> and it takes time, right? Like when I bought my first like real estate deal, it took me a year to save up the money. Um, and so we, you know, there's no such thing as a stupid question, but it's, it's, except how can I add value? But I just want to make sure we talk to investors and make sure they know what they're getting into. And if you, whether it's a deal or underwriting, I'll never say it's a bad deal because it's just, you got to be in the right market, the right business plan. Like if I was doing co-living, I'd be dead in the water. But Jesse, on the other end, has a different, you know, skill set and market than what I'm doing good at. So, and that's okay. There's a million ways to make a million dollars. That's a mic drop right there. Mike, what's the best way people can reach out and find you? All my handles are at value at Mike, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Twitter's an underrated platform uh, to see operators can get sometimes a little toxic, but read between the lines and don't believe everything. Um, and then Mike uh, We're here to serve and just help you take over the world and help people like you, Jesse, whatever way we can and add value to them. Hey, our growth house motto is you become who you surround yourself with Mike. Appreciate you. I'm honored to surround myself with you for the last 48 minutes. With that being said, Growth House Podcast, Jesse Ray, we're out.